So here again, in a view of the intermediate gray matter of the sacral cord, we find the location of these neurons. Now, as I mentioned in broader view, what these neurons actually do is they exit the spinal cord through the ventral roots, they bypass our um, paravertebral sympathetic trunk, and rather they make their way to ganglia that are associated with the viscera. And that's where we find our synapse with our postganglionic neuron. And the postganglionic neuron then supplies the visceral tissue, whatever that target organ happens to be. Now before we move on and consider more central aspects of visceral motor integration, um, I want us to just uh, make a couple of, of points of emphasis here. Now, I want you to understand that uh, there's always coordination of activity uh, in our sympathetic outflow and our parasympathetic outflow. Yes, they do represent um, rather uh, extreme ends of a continuum of function, but that function is a continuum, and there is tone in the outflow of each division all of the time. So uh, while sometimes it's helpful to emphasize, for example, that our sympathetic division is about fight or flight or the mobilization of resources for action, I want you to understand that that's not the only circumstance in which there is outflow from our sympathetic division. And likewise, for our parasympathetic division, sometimes we consider this to be a division that is restoring resources in times of resting and digesting. And it's perfectly fine to uh, use those kinds of monikers as a way of understanding the principal actions of these divisions. But what I really want you to get is the idea that there is a continuum of action here where there is tone in each side of this visceral motor outflow. And the uh, couple of points that I want you to take away from this are that the functions are complementary, but they're coordinated. There's always some tonic activity in both divisions of the visceral motor outflow. And while it's possible to increase activation in uh, a wholesale fashion across multiple visceral organs, that is not necessarily how these functions are coordinated. Rather, there can be local coordination of sympathetic and parasympathetic outflow that can serve to coordinate the activity of just one organ system without necessarily engaging uh, the entire visceral uh, effector system in an all or none fashion. Well, one important context in which this ongoing coordination of parasympathetic and sympathetic activity is played out at the organ-specific level uh, reflects the operation of reflex activity. So I want us to now begin to move into higher levels of processing in the central nervous system. But before we get there, I want you to appreciate the fact that there is a rich source of sensory information that is coming into the central nervous system and this information is integrated at various levels. Uh, at one level of input, there is integration in an important nucleus of the brainstem that I'll talk about in a little bit more detail in just a moment called the nucleus of the solitary tract. There's also integration in the spinal cord um, for the viscera of the abdomen, uh, especially. And then there is outflow from this network that's integrating these sensory signals to preganglionic neurons that then can engage a visceral motor response. So uh, this kind of reflex activity is not unlike our segmental reflexes that organize the output of our alpha motor neurons, as we've talked about when we discussed the myotactic reflex, for example. So there's sensory signals that are integrated at a very local level and that can influence the output of our preganglionic neurons, both parasympathetic and sympathetic. In this way, the activity in a visceral effector system can be regulated in a moment-to-moment -moment basis with adjustments in the tone of our sympathetic or parasympathetic outflow, depending upon the organ system in question. Well, I want to say a little bit more about uh, the sources of this visceral sensory input. So this visceral sensory input essentially comes uh, through two cranial nerves and through collaterals of our anterolateral pathway. So in this illustration, 
we see those two cranial nerves. They are the glossopharyngeal nerve, cranial nerve 9, and the vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10. So the sensory information comes via the neurons that are associated with the ganglia of these two cranial nerves, and their peripheral process is very much like our um, somatic sensory elements that we've already discussed, mechanosensory axons, uh, nociceptive axons, free nerve endings. But in the case of our visceral motor afferents, there are also uh, specialized tissues in certain regions of the body that are sensitive to the chemistry of the blood that's uh, flowing past these structures or the chemistry of the extracellular fluids. And so there are chemoreceptors that are sensitive to changes in pH, in carbon dioxide, in oxygen tensions, for example. So there are mechanosensory afferents, there are nociceptive afferents, and there are chemosensory afferents, all supplying information that is fed into the central nervous system. So, uh, as I mentioned, an important integrator of this incoming information is this nucleus of the solitary tract. And we've already talked about this nucleus when we talked about our gustatory system. As you'll recall, this nucleus really has two principal divisions to it. There's a rostral division, which is receiving this incoming uh, special visceral sensory information about taste. And then there's a caudal division, and that's the part that I want to focus on here. It's this caudal division that's receiving this input from these cranial nerves and from collaterals of our anterolateral system. So this nucleus of the solitary tract then is really a key center that integrates incoming visceral sensory signals. So just to give you a, a view in a brainstem cross-section, this nucleus is really quite distinct. It's found in the upper part of the medulla, and we recognize it as something that looks sort of like a bullseye. Uh, there is a dark myelinated spot right in the middle of the nucleus. So, so that spot that is actually the axons of these uh, afferents that are entering this nucleus. And uh, it's dark because these afferents are well myelinated. And the gray matter of the nucleus of the solitary tract surrounds this tract. So hence uh, you can understand uh, why this is called the solitary tract because it's sort of sitting there uh, by itself in isolation and it's isolated then by the gray matter of the nucleus that surrounds this solitary tract. Well, that's where you would find uh, this nucleus, the upper part of the medulla, the dorsal aspect of the tegmentum. Now, I want to make just one other comment about visceral sensory afferents, and it's reflecting some fairly recent discoveries about um, the way that visceral pain is processed in the central nervous system there is now a, a well-understood pathway that runs through the medial part of the dorsal columns of the spinal cord that conveys visceral pain information. Now this is uh, in addition to the pathways that run through our anterolateral system, so I, I don't want you to hear me saying that uh, this conflicts with what I just said about the anterolateral afferent supplying the nucleus of the solitary tract. Rather, this is an additional pathway that was discovered in the uh, late 80s and the early part of the 90s. And what we think is happening here is a pathway that connects especially the lower GI system uh, from the first order afferent, which would be a nociceptive element in the appropriate spinal root uh, to a set of second order neurons that are found near the central canal of the spinal cord. And these neurons send an axon not to the anterolateral system as we might have anticipated, but rather up along the medial edge of the dorsal columns. And there they synapse with neurons in the dorsal column nuclei that grow an axon that appears to enter the medial lumniscal pathway and make synapses on neurons in the ventral posterior complex that project not up to the postcentral gyrus, but rather into the insular cortex, where representation of visceral sensory information seems to be elaborated at the level of the cerebral cortex. Well, this pathway is worth mentioning because it highlights an important uh, clinical phenomenon 
that I should mention, and that is referred pain. Now, referred pain is often considered a phenomenon involving a crosstalk between uh, dorsal root ganglion neurons that supply, uh, let's say, skin tissue and dorsal root ganglion neurons that might supply visceral tissue. So here I'll just indicate that this is uh, maybe the lumen of the gut and there's some kind of a visceral sensory axon uh, innervating that tissue. Well, the central processes of, of these neurons might very well converge upon the same cell in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. So here's the uh, spinal cord. Let's just say this is the dorsal horn. And somewhere in here is a second order neuron of the anterolateral pathway. So one might imagine that the pain associated with this pathological process in the viscera might actually get referred to the more peripheral structure. And the fact that these patterns are so predictable uh, suggests that they actually do align with the organization of the body map in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord according to the segments of the spinal nerves. So illustrated here, for example, are visceral pain patterns associated with the esophagus, with the heart, and with the left ureter. So uh, this dorsal horn crosstalk hypothesis provides a reasonable framework for explaining these referred pain patterns. Well, it has uh, occurred to me, certainly, and others, that this newly discovered dorsal column visceral pain pathway provides yet an additional possible explanation of referred pain. Uh, consider the gracile nucleus, for example. It's integrating inputs from the lower part of the body, from uh, mechanosensory afferents that are more peripheral in their distribution, in the cutaneous surfaces, in uh, the deeper tissues of the limbs, for example. But in experimental studies using non-human primates, for example, we know that the very same gracile nucleus neurons may also respond to distension of the bowel. So they seem to be receiving input from visceral nociceptors in addition to their mechanosensory afferents concerning the lower extremity. So this might be yet another means by which some kind of crosstalk uh, might occur uh, at the level of innervation of a distinct gray matter structure. So just keep in mind, referred pain doesn't necessarily have to happen via interactions in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. It actually might happen at multiple levels of our somatic sensory pathways. At least I think this gracile nucleus is a good candidate uh, where some visceral pain uh, might be referred to a more peripheral target. Well, let's get back to thinking more broadly then about the central integration of visceral sensory signals as the output of the visceral motor system is organized and ultimately coordinated.